So I'm hoping you're not hearing it because of this microphone setup, but if you hear what sound like biblical winds, that's happening right outside my window right now. Honestly, any second now I'm gonna see a green woman on a bicycle. <laughs> oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a professional international theatre critic, as well as a content creator based here on social media. And what I do is I go and see shows, and I make video reviews about them, and I post them here on YouTube. But you can also find me on Instagram, TikTok, the app formerly known as Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn for business inquiries, at Mickey Joe Theatre. And happy 2024, everybody. I hope everyone's year is off to a positive start. Maximum dreams, minimum regrets. But before we bask in the glory of a brand new and exciting year of theatre going, videos about that to come very soon here on my channel, I am still looking to the past, much like one third of Dickensian Christmas ghosts. I have used that joke before. I am recycling it. I have no shame in that. There's a hair in this. Is that my hair? That's my hair. So as you may have seen a few days ago, with hours until the year ended, I shared a video all about my favourite theatre of 2023, and I saw almost 250 shows last year over four different countries, five different countries, three continents. And that was a really fun video to put together, talking about the stuff that had inspired me most in the last year, made me the most excited and engaged. But when we're talking about theatre criticism, there is a duality to that. It's not all about boosting and uplifting and celebrating. We also have to be constructive and point out when things aren't so great. Theatre criticism, much like almost everything else, exists on a spectrum. And while I had my favourite shows in 2023, I also had my least favourites. In other words, shows that left me disappointed, for whatever reason. Now, I'm probably calling this video something like the worst theatre I saw in 2023, which is bound to get me in some sort of trouble, but YouTube titles don't allow for a lot of nuance. What this video is probably closer to is shows that left me the most personally disappointed. So the shows on this list may not be the worst things that I saw, but they're the ones that, that made me the most sad, I'll say that much. You'll Honestly, you'll get it when I tell you what they are. And if anyone thinks that this is a mean-spirited concept for a video. None of these are reviews that I haven't shared before, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from a negative review, from a negative theatrical experience. We can look at all of these shows and think, what is it that went wrong here that fails to engage me personally as a theatergoer? In other words, why did I not enjoy these shows? Let's talk about it. But before we do, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. I'm getting close to 60,000 subscribers here, which is super exciting. I, of course, will very soon be sharing new content from 2024, talking about the shows I'm most looking forward to, and before too long, I'm going to be off to the theatre seeing shows and going on some trips that I'm sure you will be excited about. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of that fun theatre-themed content. But for now, let's look back to 2023 for the last time and talk about the shows that left me disappointed. So I ranked my favourite shows. These are going to be in no particular order because I do think it's needlessly nasty of me to say like, this one, this was the worst. So these are going to be random, non-specific order. Let's get into it. Starting with the one you may have already guessed because when I made my Broadway ranking video, this came out on the bottom and also because I'm literally wearing the t-shirt right now. New York, New York. So at the risk of repeating myself, this was the stage adaptation of the film of the same name starring Robert De Niro and Liza Minnelli, although it took several liberties in adapting the film to the stage. It featured some of the original Candor and Ebb music with an expanded score with new work from legendary theatre composer John Candor, as well as from Lin-Manuel Miranda, the two of them being part of a prestigious creative team, illustrious producers attached to this, and a really vast budget. All of which had me anticipating something very exciting, something lush and sweeping and classic, and unfortunately it just left me cold. Let's hear a little more of what I thought of the show. Before I saw it, I had very high expectations based on these creatives based on the Susan Stroman of it all, and Lin-Manuel Miranda collaborating with John Kander. That rhymed, unintentionally. And above all else, the amount of money that was poured into this show. But, needless to say, money doesn't buy you artistic merit. Sprawling, unwieldy, and surprisingly dull. I would add in surprisingly long for how dull it is. It's one of those narratives that just separates its romantic protagonists repeatedly due to poor communication that could be so easily resolved. So this is what the show is. You have these five strands of different characters living in post-World War II New York trying to make it as musicians, which is a great premise except for the fact that the three of them that aren't Jimmy and Francine don't really get fleshed out, which is surprising, again, given how long this show is. They have material, it just lacks depth and it lacks 
character. This one distinctly lacks tension and bite and consequence. You don't really know what the point of any of this show is other than these two people who fall in love and ultimately end up together after encountering some needless obstacles. I did say after leaving the show, it feels like a score of Kander and Ebb B-sides. It feels like the kind of songs that were cut from Chicago when they made the movie. And it does have charm. It is endearing, but I think charming is the very best that it achieves. I cannot fathom doing New York, New York as a song and not doing a kick line. Perhaps it's obvious, perhaps it's cliched even, and perhaps it's not super contemporary, but I feel like it's what you have to do. There are certain songs that just demand it. How you can do that final bit of New York, New York and not have it's up to you, kick, new kick, York, kick, new kick, go, kick, jump, kick, jump, kick, jump, kick, in a whole line. And again, cliched, old school, but appropriate. And it didn't happen. And that boggled my mind. Next up, a show that has historically not been well liked by the critics, but has succeeded with audiences nonetheless. Which, honestly, good for them. I am talking about one of the biggest hits of the summer, We Will Rock You. Now, as I just said that, it's occurring to me this may have appeared in my list of biggest disappointments last year when it was on tour and it arrived at the London Coliseum this summer for an extended run, and they very much tried to reframe this as a new production. There were a couple of differences, but it was broadly the same production coming in from the tour, and because they tried to portray it as a different production, I'm going to include it again once more as one of my biggest disappointments of 2023, and it's not because I don't like the show. If this was the original London production we were talking about, and their commitment to sort of fun, bold theatrical staging and a commitment to storytelling, then I probably wouldn't be calling this one of my biggest disappointments. But let me tell you what my issue was with this production. I don't mind the silliness. I don't mind the overdramatic characters. And I know that it's not really for my generation. Like I said, Star Wars, music festival drugs. But the problem here is that you have these two opposing mindsets. You have Global Soft and their homogenized pop, and you have the Bohemian Rebels trying to bring back live rock music, and the problem is that what they all sing sounds the same. The show has gaping structural issues, where we will stay with the same characters for three songs at a time. They will just sing three different Queen songs in a row for no discernible reason. And speaking of similarities to the original production, if you liked the graphics that they had in the background, don't worry, many of them are exactly the same. Yes, over two decades later, we are still using the same Sims 2-esque footage of a lot of other people in the background going on for rows and rows and rows singing Radio Gaga doing this. Galileo and Scaramouche run up onto a set piece in the background and she sings it angrily at him and then they run back down immediately. This happens three times in a row and the blocking is exactly the same. They run up the stairs, 200 degrees, that's why they call me Mrs. Fahrenheit, down the stairs. It's just overblown, high volume, rock and roll indulgence. Next we have the first of a couple of touring productions that I sadly did not love this year, even though I'd been really looking forward to it. I am talking about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So this was a new touring production of the musical adaptation of the Rolls Dahl story that has changed heavily since it first appeared at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. It was significantly reworked for Broadway, and now this is the first time it's been seen since then in the UK, and again, it has undergone some changes. Now, at no point in its development do I think it's really successfully addressed the inherent structural issues, but aside from all of that, this tour had bigger problems. They made the decision to put the interval right before we go into the factory for the first time, which means the entire first act is this protracted exposition. We go through this back and forth of, oh, he's gonna save up money to get a chocolate bar. Oh, and there's a golden ticket. Oh, but there wasn't a golden ticket in that one. Oh, and then gonna try and find a way to get another chocolate bar. Oh, there's still not a golden ticket in that one. And it's just far too long. All of the most iconic scenes and visuals all happen inside the chocolate factory, right? In the first act, we have this shack that moves forwards and backwards. We have a junkyard set that comes together. And in the second act, we go into the factory. And because we've had this entire first act to build it up, we have huge expectations. But by the time we get into the factory, we realize it is just screens. There is projection in a big semicircle on the floor. There is projection on the back wall behind these characters. And when Gareth Snook as Willy Wonka sings Pure Imagination, He's just moving his hands while little colorful sparks are flying around him. 
there are some very clever and very detailed and very well designed projections happening when they're in the chocolate room and when they go through the next rooms in the factory but for the most part there is no sense of wonder whatsoever it's not unbelievable and magic what's created on that stage we're lucky if we get a single set piece brought on in each different room of the factory it's just such an anti-climax it's a little bit embarrassing honestly watching these actors standing on this empty stage having to pretend to pluck things from around them like i said it's not that they don't have the budget of the original, it's that they have no innovation to compensate for that. And a big problem with doing this digitally is there is another room later in the factory, the room where Mike TV is going to get shrunk and transported into a TV screen that is all about technology. So having this first chocolate room be not real and tangible but technological kind of steps on the toes of that later moment. I don't think screens and a huge reliance on technology are going to create the same sense of wonder because we can we can see how it's happening. You can put anything you want on onto a screen. That's not blowing our minds. That's not a fantasy escape and it's not magical. But Charlie and the Chocolate Factory wasn't the only tour that I did not love last year. Because unfortunately I did not have a positive experience when I went back to the new Wimbledon theatre, this time to see Shrek. Now do not get me wrong, I am not sitting here telling you that Shrek is a bad musical. I love Shrek. It's probably because I love the musical version of Shrek by Janine Tesori and David Lindsay Abair that I was so disappointed in this new production. Shrek similarly was first seen at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. I saw it there when I was a teenager and I loved it. It has since gone on several UK tours and this is a brand new, ostensibly cheaper production directed by Nick Winston. Let me tell you a little bit more about it. The biggest change, perhaps, in this revival is that Lord Farquaad, who is canonically half dwarf, and historically on stage, this has always been played to comedic effect by having an actor on his knees in a costume that has little shoes coming out of his knees and he'd wear knee, knee pads and the cape would extend to the back of his feet and he would sort of walk around on his knees and it's it's a comedy thing. He has little fake legs that he like can cross over to look nonchalant. But for this tour, they are not doing that. So much of this script and so many of the laughs throughout come from visual jokes about Farquaad and jokes that other characters make at his expense. And in sensitivities to a community notwithstanding, it really is where a huge amount of this comedy comes from, especially for the adults in the audience. We do have a dragon puppet during the song Forever. There is a performer on stage dressed in a kind of dragonish outfit who is singing and then a dragon puppet behind whose mouth stays just agape for most of the song. And while we're on this topic, I will mention, if you can't make the dragon accurately lip sync to the lyrics, which is difficult to do, that's hard to puppeteer, but if you can't do it, keep the dragon's mouth closed rather than just like, ah. In previous productions, Pinocchio has had a device on his nose that allows it to grow whenever he tells a lie, and there are moments in the script for this to happen, and it gets referenced. Uh, and those moments remain and the references remain, but the nose doesn't grow in this production. Pinocchio just has this extended nose and nothing else happens with it. Looking back on it, I did not laugh once and any little thing that I would look to hold on to to enjoy about this show I didn't think was a particularly good production of material I actually really enjoy wasn't there. My biggest issue with his direction is like I said before, it's just so unimaginative to just have the actors come out and stand in front of the same same screen with different images on it and just play the scene and just act like you're walking and then just act like you're walking but now it's a bridge, act like you're abseiling down this tower. It looks so clunky and it makes it feel like the version of Shrek that you would see happening in Universal Studios rather than touring around to a bunch of professional UK theatres. This next show, another one I saw in the US, this broke my heart. And I was so willing this to be good, but in the days leading up to seeing this show, I saw it right at the end of its run, everyone I knew who'd seen this was telling me that it was not good. I am talking sadly about Hercules. Now Hercules is about to be produced in Germany. This is going to be a new production with a new director attached. I saw it at the Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey. And there was a really talented cast. There were some visual elements I enjoyed, but for plenty of other reasons, this show did not work for me which is kind of mind boggling because Hercules, I think is one of the Disney animated films that is the most 
easy to adapt, the easiest to bring to the stage. But unfortunately, this adaptation was a little short of godlike. Here is a review I filmed from my hotel room at the Civilian Hotel in Hell's Kitchen, telling you why. Philatetes, Hercules' trainer, is now no longer a mythological creature. I believe he was a satyr in the film. He is now just a dude in a tracksuit. And it's this kind of, like, diminishing of the Disney magic of it all that makes it feel just a little bit less special. But it feels a little bit cheap. It feels as though it is pandering to a younger audience. It feels like they've looked for the easiest way of making Hercules happen, and they have just put it directly onto a stage. We don't have Meg sacrificing herself to save Hercules from a falling column. We're just told that she bravely tried to fight Hades, and then he presumably killed her with his very small flame hands. The Titans are vanquished by the people of Thebes, an ensemble of perhaps 12 who stand in a line and join hands and slowly walk upstage so that these two titan puppet monsters who look exactly the same as each other just have to back up into the prison from whence they were released. These titans who were going to conquer the entire world, like not just, not just Thebes and not just Greece, like Hades has international scope here, but this ensemble of 12 was like, nah, because the power of community doth compel you. I don't know if there is a connection between the choreography being the way it was and the fact that a handful of the up-tempo numbers had to be heavily slowed down. Gosh, th far too slow. I didn't like the keys of all of the songs, specifically A Star Is Born. What's thrilling about that melody is it climbs and it climbs and it climbs. And when they start higher, they have to then modify the melody on the next one and then come down the octave slightly awkwardly. They didn't really have discernible personalities. One of the great things about the muses in the animated films, not only do they sound fantastic, but they have these relationships with each other. They have the sort of leader who scolds the other one, and they have the comic silly one, and then we have the dramatic one. There was no sense of comedy with the muses. The muses were not camp and whimsical, and I would have liked for them to be. They were literally just the Supremes. They're just swooshing their dresses, being the Supremes, being ancient Greece dream girls. And that shows a limited imagination. That is very much a limited imagination. One of the most baffling shows I saw this year was found off West End at Southwark Playhouse Elephant, the brand new venue that I have seen many excellent shows at. This was not one of them. This actually had its official press night while we were in New York, and it was one of a few things that we made a point of trying to reschedule when we came back, which in hindsight was a mistake. Perhaps you saw it, I am talking about Berlusconi. Now this was a musical all about the life of the late Italian leader that was at its core tonally deeply confused. There is plenty more to say about this, let's hear what I had to say when I reviewed this show on Instagram. So this is a musical based on the controversial life and times of former Italian leader Silvio Berlusconi. If you know nothing about him and don't fancy the Google search, he is very much in step with the trend towards obnoxious male world leaders. Think of him as the Donald Trump of Central Europe. The musical has been written by Ricky Simmons and Simon Vaughan based on an original idea by Alan Haling. Although original is not the first word I would use to describe it. It feels very much like a thinly veiled parody of Jesus Christ Superstar with this controversial political figure at its center. And the core issue with this show is it cannot decide whether it is giving you a tongue-in-cheek farcical parody of his obnoxiousness and his corruption, or if it's giving you some very sincere take on it. I'd say half of the lyrics were intelligible, and what I could hear didn't really make any incisive inferences into his life, they just really commented on what everybody already knows. The brilliance behind musicals like Evita and Jesus Christ Superstar that chart a figure's rise and fall is that they provide a level of commentary and they have a perspective on that individual. And what both of those have that Berlusconi did not have is a narrator character. I felt like that really would have benefited this show if we had this third party perspective. And they were so close to having that as well. We had a news reporter character who had personal history with him. We had the prosecuting lawyer who had a grudge against him. Such easy people people to use as the narrator character to comment on his life, and they did on occasion, but not consistently. The show would attempt to juxtapose these ridiculous numbers, 
like him singing a love song with Vladimir Putin who is shirtless in a field and rhyming I'm going to rig your next election with I think I'm getting an erection. And then you would get what I describe as theatrical whiplash because we would transition offensively quickly into songs sung by young women who were sexually abused. Natalie Kasanga does a beautiful job of singing one of those songs, but where it's situated in the show just does not make sense. Sebastian Torquia plays the title role of Silvio Berlusconi with what I would describe as unparalleled commitment. Sally Ann Triplett really tries to land this one, but even she cannot make this material work. And my final shout out has to go to musical director and vocal arranger Jordan Lee Smith, who sang in for the female role of Berlusconi's mother and gave a lovely performance from offstage. Unfortunately, there is very little praise I can give to this show. And not to disparage Southwark Playhouse, who again have produced many fantastic shows this year, but it wasn't the only disappointing musical that I saw there, because I wasn't particularly thrilled by a revival of How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. Now this has been an older musical which has been revived a handful of times on Broadway. It's seen less frequently in the UK. Parts of the material certainly feel a little bit dated, but this production was trying to infuse a new exuberant queer life into the piece with a very trans and non-binary inclusive and gender swapped approach to the casting. The trouble is as great as that idea might have been, if it isn't capably realized, then it doesn't always work. And there is this gender flipped idea with some of the casting. However, this works better in some instances than others, but I will get to that when I talk about the performances specifically. All in all, it has this slightly frenzied camp energy, which I really enjoyed. If anything, I would have liked for them to have lent further into the wildness of all of it. I really liked the costuming for that reason. I liked their bold uses of color. I had a few issues with the set. There was really very little that I enjoyed about this set. The one backdrop that we had looked a little bit cheap. The few set pieces that they brought on to create different spaces within the office building also looked cheap. They had this ladder motif to represent the climbing up of the corporate ladder, but the ladders were very underutilized. Occasionally they got used, but for the most part people just avoided them. My biggest issue, mostly with set, but also a little bit with costume, was that we didn't get the sense of progression conveyed. You have Finch, this character who arrives in the company and is working in the mailroom and gradually rises through the ranks. He gets these increasingly nice offices. His first office doesn't have a door. And then we have a lot of scenes subsequently that take place in Mr. Bigley's office, which is meant to be comparatively very lush. He gets taken to all of these executive exclusive spaces. And we get none of that because the stage looks the same constantly. We have this one table that moves around. We have spinny office chairs that don't get any nicer in quality. And we have a ladder that is occasionally put up. In fact, JB Bigley's office, which is meant to be the height of corporate achievement uh, really doesn't look that fantastic because they put up this ladder and it looks like it's being decorated. It looks like an office undergoing renovation. We don't get this sense of him having progressed up through the ranks of the company and not with costuming either. We get this one tear away where Finch goes from window washer to businessman, but then that outfit is kind of a constant throughout the rest of the show. One big thing we really lacked was a sense of romance and the heart of the show. That felt almost entirely absent because we really lacked for romantic chemistry. And that I think was partially the impact of this reconceived casting. Next up, this one might split the room because I was definitely not the only person who disliked this show, but there were plenty of people who really did enjoy it. People thought it was moving and passionate and soulful and I was just bored to tears. I am talking about the play adaptation of the film Brokeback Mountain. Now this was seen last summer at the venue at Soho Place. It starred Mike Feist and Lucas Hedges in a theatrical adaptation of the popular film, which had starred Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal. It featured music and the way that they cultivated atmosphere on stage and evoked these locations I thought was very, very strong and the performances themselves as well. My issue was the very, very, very sparse script. Everything about this show's atmosphere is instilled brilliantly, but the issue that the script has that the music can't really help with in the way that it's being utilized is that we don't ever really articulate the emotions of any of these characters particularly clearly or particularly effectively or particularly dramatically. One scene is introduced incredibly slowly with all of this expositional underscoring and this scene transition and this lighting transition to bring a character on in a bed. We have another character walking in. She says a single sentence 
and then the scene ends. We have more lighting transition, more music transition, and this is quite characteristic of much of the play. Ultimately, as much as I really wanted to love this and for it to be this new, exciting thing with compelling creative choices and great casting, it was fatally dull. Now, even those who do not know much about the film Brokeback Mountain know that this is the one with the gay cowboys. And we get to that moment really quite early on in the play. We have an awful lot of exposition about logistics to do with these sheep and the mountain and the jobs that these two are being hired to carry out, but we have very little development of the relationship between these two characters. One of them is a little bit more forthcoming, the other one is reserved and stoic and awkward, and they don't really have that much to say to each other. Their conversations are stilted and we run through a couple of days in which they don't really have that much to talk about. Certainly I'm not picking up on any sexual tension. If there is any, then it's incredibly thickly veiled. Maybe I just don't know enough about cowboys. Perhaps it was all there in like a cowboy code. But startlingly quickly, with almost no development of their relationship or indication that this is going to happen, we arrive at this moment where they're enduring a very cold night's sleep and Jack tells Ennis that he just needs to come and join him in the tent and then they have an amorous liaison in the tent. And I almost got whiplash from how quickly this turned from no conversation whatsoever between these two characters into like fully banging in the tent. Like, I, it's not that I didn't see it coming, I knew that it was going to happen, but I was certain that there was going to be more leading us into that moment. Like, where was the sexual tension? Where were the stolen glances and the longing? Where was the implication of their true desires? Sometimes a disappointing theatrical experience comes when you finally get to see a show you've wanted to see for a long time, maybe you fell in love with the cast recording, and it doesn't live up to your expectations. That happened for me when I went to the Hope Mill Theatre in Manchester, a venue that I love, to go and see Head Over Heels. Now I had a fairly basic understanding of this show, having not seen it before, I had listened to the cast recording a lot, and for reasons partially to do with the material, but largely to do with this production, I did not love it. Let's hear a little more about why. This is a jukebox musical featuring the songs of the Go-Go's and based on the Arcadia by Sir Philip Sidney. This is the programme and as you can tell it's fun, it's contemporary, it's modern, it's a little bit queer, it's very queer in fact. I just don't think that the tone was consistent. If you're going to do this Shakespearean-esque plot you have to commit to it wholeheartedly and I just don't think that they were. Whether that's a performance issue, whether that's a direction issue, I just wanted people to commit to the ridiculousness of the plot and their over-the-top characters, and I felt like everyone was maybe between 60 and 70 percent committed to the madcap characterizations that they'd been dealt by this ridiculous script. I also think the opening number as fun as the song is, just the way it was staged was a little bit too static and like we're gonna stand and look powerful and like we got the beat, we got the beat, we got the beat with four ensemble members dancing their hearts out and the main characters standing around looking regal and royal family-esque. I don't think that was the way to stage it because it was almost a little bit standoffish. I wanted it to seem more fun. This is gonna segue me immediately into another issue. The whole plot of the show is about the king being so worried that they are going to lose this paradise of Arcadia. And the design and the feel of the location isn't lush and paradise-like. I just wanted for it to be more vibrant and colourful and fun, but from the off you get this sort of solemn sense to the royal family and the set design. I thought it was cool, but it was very grey with a single throne and a little bit of curtains at the back and these pillars that had neon lights in them, which was cool when they got used, but they were severed like you might find in a wrecked temple. And if it's meant to be of the time, then the pillars shouldn't be severed. The whole thing was grey and ancient looking like we were seeing it in a modern time rather than seeing it as it would have been. I wanted it to look like a beautiful paradise. I wanted it to be brighter, I wanted there to be some green to it. They subsequently go into the forest and we see no leaves whatsoever. I'm getting very cross with shows that depict trees and forestry with no leaves. I just want to see leaves. I can't tell you how much happier I would have been in this show 
if I had seen leaves. And it's starting to feel like that's just a weird thing about me. Now, I wasn't just disappointed by shows I was expecting to love. Sometimes I give a show a chance and something that I historically have not enjoyed, I return to, to see if it's developed and changed and improved. Unfortunately, that was not the case when I went to go and see the new UK tour of the musical Treason at the Alexandra Palace Theatre. This was a show whose concept album had gained it a certain amount of popularity during lockdown. It was staged in concert at Theatre Royal Drury Lane. I had reviewed that here on YouTube, and I think they made marginal improvements for this most recent run of the show, but there are still enduring problems. Let's find out what they are. So it did feature a lot of this Hamilton style of choreography by the ensemble. There were two songs in a row right before the end of the first act where the Catholics were all plotting and conspiring and having a meeting together. For both of the numbers, for what felt like about eight minutes on stage, you had the ensemble around them doing these like contemporary Hamilton-esque pieces of choreography. And it's just a long time to be holding a secretive meeting while people do elaborate choreography around the outside of you. And there's no sense of growth or development through that staging. It was just consistently a little bit unusual. And it doesn't really feel compatible with this particular story because what Hamilton had was a contemporary sounding score. And this sounded a little bit more classic. It sounded a little bit Les Mis-esque at times. It sounded more traditional musical theater. And so without a contemporary quality in the music and without a contemporary quality in the script, there wasn't much of a reason why the movement ought to be so modern looking. It strikes me as one of those things where the creative team who all understand their shared vision for this material and the story that they are trying to tell aren't able to really accurately gain a sense of how well they're telling that story. The Inevitable is another good song, but it lacks the context of the script around it to explain whatever she's wrestling with in that moment. And this is a script that so often shies away from the things that it really ought to be telling us. There's a scene between Martha Percy and Anne Vaux in which Anne is about to reveal something to Martha. And so Martha says something to the extent of, what is it? You can tell me what's been going on. And then we just have this sort of fade down moment and then they fade back up in the same spot and she's told her it's happened and that conversation has already passed. And what that tells me is that as a writer, you just didn't want to write that conversation or you couldn't find a succinct enough way to explain that conversation. The biggest problems still are these poetic interludes delivered now by ghost narrator Guy Fawkes. You ultimately have no idea what he's talking about. And just personally, if I were being burned alive and was sharing literally my dying thoughts, I think clarity would probably be one of the most important qualities of that kind of a speech. Next up, this is a show I thought was gonna be really funny when I went to go and see its press launch. But by the time I actually saw the show, it became obvious that all of the best material was crammed into that specific 10 minute portion. I am talking about perhaps the most disappointing show of the year, the crown jewels. So what this play is, is a comic retelling of this actual historical event where this Irish revolutionary dude who made a big name for himself in terms of treason plotted to and successfully did steal the crown jewels of King Charles II. And it's a weird chapter of history to adapt for a comedy because it feels a little bit insubstantial. Sure, we have the heist element, and there's a little bit of comedy that you can bring out of that, but it was also this fairly bloody act of treason, so it's not the most naturally hilarious thing to adapt. Nor is it a particularly well-known chapter of history unless you're a well-versed historian, like the comedian Al Murray also happens to be. But what ends up happening is, with one hand, they try and explain and deliver us this plot and actually tell us about what's going on, and in the other, they try and parody it and make fun of it. This is by no means a sincere historical retelling. This is meant to be a silly farcical comedy. Except it doesn't quite have the characteristics of a farce. It doesn't have the pace of a farce. There are a handful of visual gags, but I wouldn't really characterize it as slapstick. This was really difficult. Because you can forgive almost anything about a show if it's funny, especially, especially a comedy. Needless to say, like, all this needed to do was to make people raucously laugh. And there were sections of the play where we did. We had the scenes where Al Murray and Mel Geardrich were on stage and those were really funny. They found a way to make those really funny, especially the moments where it just became a vehicle for them to do stand-up and interact with 
audience members and do something fresh and do something off the cuff. We then cut to scenes that are so full of exposition and character backstory and so light on humour that you question whether they're actually just trying to be scenes from a serious drama. And then occasionally, Carrie Hope Fletcher will sing something and it turns into a musical, which is fine, which is lovely. The songs themselves are a little bit basic. They remind me of the Battle of Trafalgar musical that was performed at my primary school once. He was the great Horatio Nelson. How do I remember that? I wasn't even in the show. Now, interestingly enough, the show that necessitated my first ever trip to Broadway, Bad Cinderella, is not appearing on this list. I say that because it didn't surprise me in 2023 when I thought it was just kind of fine on Broadway. I gave it a three star review and I wasn't disappointed because it was pretty in line with my expectations. The show that necessitated my next New York trip, however, did leave me disappointed. And that was the last ever Stephen Sondheim musical, Here We Are. So for a bit of context, this show has been brought to the stage after Sondheim's death and his creative involvement with it was evidently unfinished. It's a collaboration between himself and the playwright David Ives. It adapts two different films by Luis Buñuel. It features an all-star cast of very exciting performers. It is currently being produced off-Broadway at The Shed. Now when this show opened I made a video here on my channel talking about this dissonance I was perceiving between the actual content of the opening night reviews and the way that they were trying to frame their opinions of the show. It felt like critics were being a little bit disingenuous, here's what I thought. I feel as though not all of these critics are being entirely honest with their verdicts. You know, they are talking about and addressing some of the show's shortcomings, but they're wrapping it up in a tremendously opaque wrapping paper of, but it's Sondheim and it's glorious. There is music in the first act, what you could technically call a score, but what isn't really comparable with any other Sondheim score that previously exists, even his weaker ones. And in the second act, there is a brief amount of music at the beginning, and then almost no music for the duration of the second act. There is very little music in the second act. We go for a very long time for reasons that are made clear within the plot of the show without music. And dramatically speaking, it probably makes sense for them to not have music. But for that reason, this doesn't feel like a Sondheim musical. Is this the first time ever in his career that there is not one standout song? And I realized the answer was, Yes. Because it is surrealist and abstract, the music just kind of vaguely flows through the whole of the first act. It ebbs and flows with the script, which is the sign of a brilliant collaboration. I love that Sondheim can do that, but it does mean we don't get any sort of standalone song. We don't have that moment where everything just kind of pauses for a fantastic song to occur. You get that in every other score he's ever written. You do not get that in this. And Michaela plays this perhaps non-binary, allegedly a lesbian, but falls in love with a man, revolutionary activist who is complicit in trying to bring about the abstract end of the world, which is, I guess, nigh, as it so often is in these things. We see her being portrayed as utterly hypocritical because she enjoys the privileges that her uh, her friendship with all of these wealthy characters affords her. Which is a characterization I've seen multiple times and I'm just exhausted by, to be honest. I wish we didn't keep portraying these like climate activists and these left-wing activists as always being inherently hypocritical. There is one really great joke, and it's the kind of a laugh that makes you realize by comparison that there isn't as much humor in the rest of the thing. It's a gag about dogs. It's very, very funny, but it's like when you're sitting in the dark and someone turns the light on, and only then do you realize how dark it was. So next on the list, Andrew Lloyd Webber's Bad Cinderella may not feature in my most disappointing shows of 2023, but that's not to say that another of his shows doesn't. A show that closed shockingly early in London last year, I am talking about Aspects of Love. Now this is a show from the 90s whose score has attained its something of a cult following, and yes, it sounds lush, and romantic. But to my mind, that neither justifies nor excuses the really heinous plot. I would try to explain to you what the show is about now, but I feel like I'd give myself a nosebleed. So let's see what I said when I saw the show last year. During this visit, he manages to charm Rose, and after Alex comes back from war a few years later, he finds out that Rose is now his uncle's mistress. Understandably shocked by this, he shoots her. His uncle George returns to witness the aftermath of this, 
this, complains that he's shot his one genuine painting, and then immediately launches into a song about how Alex would be a much better romantic fit for Rose, the woman he's just shot. Julieta turns up at the wedding and makes out with Rose at the altar. We meet Jenny, which is this couple's 12-year-old daughter and his cousin, his first cousin. We see the two of them becoming uncomfortably close. He witnesses them embracing and kissing, promptly bursts into the room, has a heart attack and dies. And as these black shutters come in to surround them and close this moment before we transition seamlessly into a funeral, Jenny cries out with despair that she's just watched her father die. And Jamie Borgio says under his breath, it's my fault. And perhaps it's the material's fault, but the awkward delivery of this line by him gets a huge laugh from the audience. Julieta is giving a speech about living life to the full. Rose literally chucks his ashes over all of the guests. Three sentences later, the two of them leave together to go and have sex on a hay bale during the funeral of his uncle. Julieta wanders back on, asks aloud what's going to happen with Jenny, and then the four of them stand there. Meanwhile, the show, not knowing what to do, abruptly ends. And you have four or five sweeping melodies that come around like buses in quiet traffic. And if five strong tunes do not an entire quality score make, then nobody has ever told Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber that. This show is famous for the song Love Changes Everything. Love is right there in the title. And I don't know if I believed that many of these pairings were in love. I buy the affection between Laura Pitt Pulford's Rose and Michael Bull's George. That one I get. But I don't know if I get love from uh, Jamie Boggio's Alex. I definitely get love from Jenny in the second act, but that's a whole mess of its own. But those have been some of the shows that left me disappointed this year, and I am certain there will be many people who disagree with me, and I would love to hear from you in the comments section down below. If you enjoyed, if you loved any of the shows that I put on this list, let me know in the comments section. But if likewise you do feel like sharing any of the shows that left you a little bit disappointed this year, feel free to tell us about those in the comments as well and why. In the meantime, I hope that you enjoyed this video, and I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe!